Hello and welcome to Vital Signs, where we learn how to get healthy uh, from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Fallon. We've all heard the murmurings about how the, the gut, the microbiome, this colony of, of bacteria and other organism, organisms in our gut uh, can contribute to our health, but maybe we haven't been too sure about what to do about that. Today, my guest is a renowned cardiologist, and he's the best-selling author of Wheat Belly. He's going to shed some light on that. He's going to show us what can be done to, to genuinely improve the health of the gut, and he's going to give us some insights into why our microbiomes are in such a, a state of disrepair. Welcome to Vital Signs, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Brendan. Glad to be here. So you've practiced cardiology for, for 25 years. And this is a cardiology, like many systems in medicine, there's very established procedures, um, um, bypass surgery, uh, stents, there's established medications that are used for treating high blood pressure, all these different things. That's a, that seems like a, a, a very cemented system to turn away from. What actually triggered you to turn away from uh, and, and shift your focus toward the gut for restoring people's health? A series of events, Brendan, but one of the major turning points for me was the death of my mom, who underwent a two-vessel coronary angioplasty in New Jersey. This is about 30-some years ago. So she had a successful two-vessel coronary angioplasty where she, they opened two arteries, and then she promptly died in bed four months later, sudden cardiac death. Now, I was doing those procedures in, at the time, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They brought me in to set up the hospitals with new, all these new technologies that were emerging stent implantation, rotational atherectomy, drilling arteries, cutting arteries, opening them, aborting heart attacks, all that kind of stuff. And here my mom dies of a, of a disease that I thought I was doing a good job of managing. And I had trained for education and training 17 years to do that. And I realized how pointless, how inadequate it was. And so that made it, that was a turning point for me. That is, I started to think, well, what could I have done for my mom? maybe six months, a year, two years ahead of time and warned her and then taken some kind of action to have prevented that event. Well, it took years of zigzagging, trial and error, but we I started to actually achieve uh, regression or reversal of coronary disease. By the way, there's a lot of nonsense in this world too. There are people who claim to do so with ridiculous things like low-fat diets, which of course are completely absurd. You cannot reverse heart disease with low-fat diet. In fact, you, you actually advance heart disease with low-fat diet. But it well, took many years. That, that's definitely a point I, I want to explore with you a bit later, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, I want to continue with the story, but wh when did this happen? How long ago are we talking that, that you So we're this talking revelation? about the um, uh, mid-1990s, so uh, a long time ago, uh, especially given what's happened to our world in the last 10 years or so. But it made me realize that trying to manage a disease like heart disease, coronary disease, in a hospital catheterization laboratory was, was ridiculous. There's a time and place for those things. If you're having a heart attack and didn't know you had heart disease and you need to have that artery opened, that's a good use of those resources. <clears throat> but taking people like you and me and our listeners who are not in the emergency room having chest pain or can't breathe or are, are in congestive heart failure, just going about your business, going to work, going to school, going for walks, riding your bike, doing all these things. How do we stop heart disease? Well, a conventional answer is look at your cholesterol, which is so patently absurd. So in other words, if you said your total cholesterol is 240, you, are you going to die tomorrow? or in 10 years, <clears throat> you can't tell. But this that, that ridiculous notion of using cholesterol as a predictor of heart events has been propped up by the extraordinary revenue generation of pharma products, drugs. They're talking statins. So. Statin yeah. drugs and related drugs. The truth of it is, the sad truth, Brendan, is that if you focus on cholesterol and saturated fat and statin drugs, You've taken all the attention away from the real causes of heart disease. And that's why 80 million Americans take statin cholesterol drugs now. And there's been no reduction in heart disease. That's why your hospital, your local hospital, probably added a $70 million new heart wing. Because heart disease, despite all that nonsense about cholesterol and saturated fat and statins, remains the number one killer of Americans and the number one revenue source for health care. I, yeah, I heard there the statins are a very, very powerful revenue generating source. In terms of the, the heart issue, there's this metabolite that I've heard about, TMAO, and I, I know you've written about this in, in Supergut, 
And this is linked to eating, they say if you eat too much red meat, then this will raise the level of TMAO, which is linked to, to, heart, to, to heart disease and heart, cardiac events. So it, it would seem to make sense if you cut back on red meat that this is going to, to lower that risk. But it, it, is that the case? No, it's nonsense. So Stan Hazen and his group at Cleveland Clinic <clears throat> generated evidence to suggest that higher blood levels of trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, increase your risk for heart events like heart attack. So what they uh, observed was if you put, if the input is meat in any form, whether it's fish or chicken or beef or pork, increases your blood level of this marker, TMAO, that is associated with increased risk for cardiovascular events. Okay, but wait a minute now. Here's the, here's the twist. T mayo is a major metabolite of bacteria, of microbes living in your gastrointestinal tract. And if you've disrupted the composition of, of microbes in your gastrointestinal tract, which virtually everybody has, we've been overexposed to antibiotics, to other factors like glyphosate, the herbicide that kills healthy bacteria and does not kill unhealthy bacteria, stomach acid blocking drugs, chlorinated drinking water, non anti-inflammatory drugs, emulsifying agents in ice cream and salad dressings, preservatives and processed All these things have disrupted the microbial composition, specifically increasing the microbes that create t hmm. so For those of you who uh, are, are gaining an appreciation of the power of the microbiome, they increase proteobacteria, and bacteroidetes. They increase several very important species that create this t mayo marker. The problem is not the food. And think about this. Those are foods whose need is programmed in the human genetic code and that we've been consuming for millions of years. Why would something that we've been accustomed to eating for millions of years be, be uh, deleterious? So you put in this input, meat, chicken, poultry, fish, etc. It's processed by gut microbes and one of the metabolites is T mayo. The problem is not the food. The problem is the massively disrupted gastrointestinal microbiome that we've all experienced. I, and so this this raises the question, and you've touched on this a little bit already, Dr. Davis. What has has caused the such a massive disruption to our, our microbiome? And I, I have a sense that this starts from day one for us. Literally, at, at birth. You know, I've had two grandchildren now, and their mom and, and those kids received multiple courses of antibiotics at birth, pre-delivery, delivery, and post-delivery. That's just the standard of care nowadays. So every average of every adult American, one out of three is prescribed an antibiotic every year for every thousand children. 13, more than 1,300 prescriptions are written for an antibiotic every year. So you reach age 40, say, <clears throat> and you've likely taken about 30 courses of antibiotics. So massive exposure. Now, sometimes there are times when antibiotics are necessary. If you've got pneumococcal pneumonia or a urinary tract infection that's ascended to your kidneys, you need an antibiotic. But antibiotics are massively over overprescribed, CDC even tells us this. They say about half of all prescriptions for antibiotics are inappropriate or unnecessary. So massive, but it's been compounded by all those other factors like food additives as synthetic sweeteners, a diet sodas, all these things. They've all conspired to make, introduce massive changes. One of the consequences is this marker that misled a lot of people, this t mayo and has in, has increased all kinds of phenomena in modern people, like food intolerances. Think about un, how unnatural it is to not be able to eat a red pepper. Or, or, or a peanut. not I be able to eat, say, um, dairy or, or uh, other vegetables. This is extremely unnatural. If we told our great-grandmother this, she'd say, Brendan, what is wrong with you people? We ate all these things, no problem. It's a modern phenomenon due to the disruption of the gastrointestinal microbiome.